Jesus by the Spirit. Of course, Jesus gave the ultimate sacrifice for us, and he calls us to enter into that sacrifice daily by giving of ourselves to him by being living sacrifices. This is the worship that he wants. Your full devotion to him through your full service, surrender to his will. Now, truth number three, Jesus has something to say about what is true worship. And there's two components to a right worship that Jesus talks about. First, there's a right relationship with God. And second, there's a right understanding of who God is. And I get that from John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, according to Jesus, in his uh, conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well, and this woman is a Samaritan who have um, uh, combined I, uh, idol worship along with the Jewish worship, and they've come up with their own style of worship, um, and they worship uh, in a, their own distinct place. And then she knows of the, the Israel, the Jewish worship in the temple. And so she asked Jesus, what's the right worship? Uh, and Jesus tells her neither, that there's coming a time when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. They will have a right relationship with God, and they need a right understanding of who God is. That's the spirit and the truth. For God is seeking such people to worship him, and God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. You must be in a spiritual relationship with God in order to be able to worship. And you must be worshiping the true God. Is it possible to be a true believer and worship a false God? Yes, I believe it is. So we need to make sure we know the truth and we're filled with the truth and we are continually renewing our minds so that we can better understand who God is. The the more we understand God, the more accurate a understanding and a picture we have, have of him, the bigger he will be to us, the uh, more magnificent he is, the deeper our worship will be. The focus of our worship is not in a lo location. It is a person, and that is Jesus Christ. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, uh, do, not, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Be a living sacrifice because the Holy Spirit is within you. See how this verse brings it all together. Old Testament, you worship God in the temple. Why? Because that's where God's presence was. Now we worship God in spirit and in truth because God's temple is our body and he's, he's dwelling in us. And so, in a sense, we can't get away from his temple. We cannot get away from worshiping him. Uh, what we're talking about here is worshiping God always, in everything we do, is an act of worship. How different would our lives be if that is how we looked at everything we did? Work, God is with me, therefore work is an act of worship. How do I approach teaching my students as an act of worship? Studying in, the, uh, in school, is an act of worship. How do I approach studying, uh, listening to my teachers as an act of worship? Working, how do I approach work as an act of worship? Because it is. It is God is with you. Worship is about God, and we are to glorify, lift him high in everything that we do. Jesus said he is the truth, and we are to worship 
in truth. We worship the truth by studying his word and getting to know him more and more. And the deeper we know him, the deeper our, our worship at work, at, at uh, school, at church, the deeper that will be as we know him more. Uh, a couple of verses let me bring out. Uh, one is Ephesians 5, uh, 19 to 20. It says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and uh, spiritual songs. Uh, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus. So what, well, let me, let's go on to the next verse, because it's basically it's a uh, repeat. He's, uh, Paul says in Colossians, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts. So what does worship look like? It looks like a, um, a person who has fully sacrificed his life to the Lord, who is relating to other Christians through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And we, we, we are walking around with a thankfulness in our hearts to God. That is who we are, Christian. Uh, we are worshipers. God has created us to be worshipers. I find it interesting that when Jesus says that we are to worship in spirit and truth, he doesn't uh, contrast it with a physical manifestation of worship because that's not what it's about. It's about a heart issue, a spirit issue, an understanding issue, which then flows naturally into a physical manifestation of singing and worshiping and thankfulness. That's what worship is. Worship is a, re a right relationship with him and is a right understanding of who he is. And so worship is what you've been created to do. I want to bring this around to why church now. Um, and I want to give you six reasons that we need to worship at church. And I get this from uh, a, a sermon by David Clarkson, who uh, was a successor to John Owen, who preached a sermon on Psalm 87 entitled, Public Worship to be Preferred Before Private Worship. And he gave 12 reasons, which were condensed into a quick bullet, 12 bullet points, by a, a Presbyterian pastor, and then I took those and I condensed them to six reasons, and I kind of added one at the end uh, to make up the six. So let's look at these six reasons why we should worship together rather than individually, privately. First of all, the Lord is more glorified by public worship, worshiping together, than by private worship. Why? Well, God is glorified when we acknowledge him before man. Throughout scripture, it talks about they'll know you by your love. They'll know you by your relationship. They'll know you by your praise. And how will they know you? Only if they see this. Um, in church, it's when we come together and we glorify God together we are lifting him up and we're magnifying him uh, as a, a body coming together. And he gets more glory from that than if you stay home and worship him at home. Number two, public worship is more edifying than private worship. We are called to encourage one another. In private, you provide your, for your own good. But in public, you do good to others and yourself, and they bless you. And so there's a, um, a beautiful thing that happens in church where people from all walks of life come together under the banner of Jesus Christ 
for the purpose of worshiping him um, and using our gifts to encourage and lift each other up. Uh, thirdly, uh, public worship is better security against apostasy and false teaching than private worship. There are far too many people who are being led astray by televangelists, by online preachers who preach a gospel of self-help, a gospel of, um, uh, of, of get what you want, you worship God and he will give you riches. Um, there are many of these out here. One of the worst ones and most deceptive is Joel Olstein. In he, he is not about worshiping God. He is about building up a, uh, himself and self-help and helping you become the most that you can be. But it's not about that. It should be about God. So worshiping by yourself alone, it's easy to be led astray by this type of thing. Come together and we can hold each other accountable. Uh, public worship is the nearest resemblance of heaven. And I've heard this many times from various people about TICF specifically saying that this is what it's going to be like in heaven. People from all walks of life, all cultures, uh, coming together to worship God together. It's a beautiful thing. Fifth, the most renowned servants of God have preferred public worship. So we have a historical reason. Paul did not uh, encourage people to worship by themselves. He encouraged and he set up churches in uh, the cities. Uh, to, so that people would come together and worship together. He says, do not neglect the coming together. Um, we see, you name uh, Martin Luther. He, uh, he, even though he started the Protestant movement, his desire was not to destroy the church, but it was to, the Catholic church. It was to reform and make it more beautiful. He was all about the church. And you name any um, uh, great servant of, of the Lord, and it's about the church. Uh, the local church is God's physical manifestation of his kingdom on earth. And let me just speak directly to our situation. We are in a city in which we do not have a church on every corner, um, we do not have uh, uh, these manifestations of his glory wherever we look. And so as people look and they see us have a building, a physical manifestation of, of worship, uh, a location to worship, and they see that we're not making use of it when we can, why? Why? Why are we not coming together to, as a show of solidarity to worship the Almighty God? You know, as, as the church, as the Muslim uh, hordes came, swept through North Africa and moved into Spain, uh, and as the church fought back and they had this back and forth, both sides um, they would set up strongholds. Uh, as they would push forward, they'd set up a stronghold, a castle. Um, and um, that's what our church is in this country that we're living in right now. The church is a stronghold and a manifestation of God here in this fallen nation. Make the most of it. When we can get back Let's make the most of our coming together. I remember when uh, we had to close down uh, because of the location that we were temporarily using uh, said they had something else that was replacing us. And because of the great work and the hard work of uh, Scott, Elder Scott and, and Rainier, we were a, we got together in a matter of 
one day we put together hundreds of people on buses and ship, got them down to Teda to worship. And that was an amazing movement of God. And it spoke volumes to people looking on at our, uh, us as believers and our commitment to this thing, uh, this church that we have. So there's six reasons uh, that we should meet together as a body of believers and worship together. I want to wrap up this by reading you a quote from uh, John Piper. And I think I love John Piper's extravagance in his speaking. And so he says this, what is worship? The inner essence of worship is to know God truly and then respond from the heart to that knowledge by valuing God, treasuring God, prizing God, enjoying God, being satisfied with God above all earthly things. And then that deep, restful, joyful satisfaction in God overflows in demonstrable acts of praise from the lips and demonstrable acts of love in serving others for the sake of Christ. Pray, worship is who we are which overflows into what we do. What we do cannot be the focus of our worship. Who we are needs to be, who we are in his presence needs to be the focus of worship because it's only from a heart that's truly focused on him, truly sacrificed on him, truly to, for him, and truly spiritual can we then manifest true worship to God. And I pray this is a challenge to you as much as it has been is a challenge to me to live my life on a daily moment by moment basis as a true sacrifice of worship uh, to the Lord. Pray with me. Father God, I thank you so much for the opportunity that you give us to have a relationship with you, to sacrifice, which is no actual sacrifice, to give ourselves fully to you, to fall on our knees and, and worship you, to, to be used by you, to be a tool in this world. I pray that we are satisfied with you, that we are, uh, we are humbled to in, in your presence, and that we have a true understanding of your greatness and the majesty and the awesomeness of who you are, which will then overflow our hearts into a worship, a true worship, Lord. We praise you and we thank you.